one of the things that's so striking about shamanism in the in the uh, native context is the absence of mental illness, the absence of uh, serious neurotic patterns of behavior. This is because this uh, translinguistic reality is allowed to work its will through shamanism, is allowed to regulate the society. In other words, our model of how society works is we are at war with nature and we must push it back, seize a beachhead, fortify our position, dig in these kinds of metaphors, metaphors of capture and control. While the shamanic approach is we must communicate with nature in order that nature can communicate with us in order that we may know what should be done. And shamanism as classically practiced is hunting magic, weather magic, healing magic. In other words, ways of getting into the evolving of state-bound system patterns within nature. Weather, we would presume, can to some degree be, produ be predicted by looking at past weather states. Hunting can to some degree be predicted by looking at the migration and movement of game in past situations. So uh, shamanism then becomes a kind of mnemonic exercise where by keeping track of what has happened, you can build up a model of what will happen. And originally this was done through great mnemonic feats of memory you know, like the Yugoslavian folktale singers or the Homeric epics or the people who sang the Edda. These were, uh, you know, works of hundreds of thousands of lines that were passed down virtually without change over millennia. But in there is a strange phenomenon in, at least in the evolution of cultures, and perhaps more generally, which is every step into freedom contains within it the potential for greater bondage. Now what I mean by that is, here's an example of it, women uh, in charge of the gathering phase in hunting gathering cultures developed language, I believe, because they had great need of the ability to make fine distinctions. In other words, here you have 50 grasses, uh, small herbs, shrubs. There are, they have roots, fruits, berries, seeds, inflorescences. Some of these things are poisonous. Some of these things are foods. Some grow in the spring, some in the fall, some along the river courses, some on the hilltops, so forth and so on. A, a great many descriptive dimensions come to bear on this. So consequently, I think women are to be uh, held responsible for the evolution of language in order to discuss the extremely important matter of what is good to eat and what is not and where do you find it and how do you preserve it and what do you combine it with and so forth and so on. Men, on the other hand, who were in charge of the hunting because of the different body type and bladder capacity and so on, uh, the premium there was placed on silence, stoicism, being able to stalk and for days make no noise possibly and to just you know sort of integrate into this silent uh, kind of thing well this same kind of uh, freedom which binds occurred in the shamanic uh, effort to steer culture by mnemonic means because eventually even the greatest of 
of the shamanic memory uh, artists were overwhelmed by the amount of data, by the size of the epics, by the sheer length of these genealogies. So then symbolic notation is brought in and, and shamanism turns into scribecraft and signifying magical forces turns into writing down their names and there is a tremendous binding a compression, a, a limitation of freedom because the strategy of freedom became uh, too successful. So this, this reaching beyond ourselves is a process that is continuous. We transcend a state, we then lock ourselves into the uh, transcendent state it becomes defined by its own set of limitations and we move beyond it. And this kind of, of uh, bootstrapping mechanism, I think, has been at work throughout the evolution of language, throughout the evolution of shamanism. Now we have come to a similar kind of bind having to do with the bankruptcy of uh, analytical analysis and rationalism, which has led us to a, a pretty complete mastery of inert matter. But when pushed into the quantum realm, suddenly contradictions begin to multiply and impossible conclusions force themselves upon the investigator. Well, what this means is that rationalism has simply reached its limit. There is nothing, no reason to think that it doesn't have a limit. It was just the inflated fantasy of the 17th century that thought that God's mind must work like the mind of a watchmaker. But in fact, uh, what with chaos theory and catastrophism and uh, numerous other um, non-equilibrium partial differential processes in nature, we now know that nature is extremely unpredictable, highly variable, not subject to uh, analytical understanding except in very limited domains. What this understanding that quantum physics has brought the physicists and that the psychedelic state has brought to the people who pursue that, it has not fed back into the mainstream of society. We're still living in a male-dominated, object-dominated, subject, other kind of... Uh, uh, world model, a world model inherited from the 18th century, uh, really even more than from the 19th century. Well, is it going to kill us? Is it too late? Uh, what can we do about it? This is what I talked about last night, about, uh, about the archaic revival as the notion of... Uh, making a sharp left turn away from the momentum that the historical vehicle wants to follow, which is phanatoptic. Don't kid yourself. I mean, you cannot have three religions stacked up on top of each other, stretching back 4,000 years, pursuing this monotheistic vision, which ends in an apocalypse without building a tremendous morphogenetic predilection for the apocalypse and our demonic investigations into matter have led us to create the machinery to produce the apocalypse. It's interesting, somebody said of, uh, of the Reagan administration, uh, this was when James Watt was running around saying we didn't have to save the trees because Jesus was coming anyway, so it didn't matter. <laughs> and uh, someone said, uh, the jerks want to be in the Bible. Yeah. 
<clears throat> and that's precisely the historical situation. The jerks want to be in the Bible. In other words, every petty potentate from Frederick Barbarossa to Ronald Reagan has secretly believed that they were uh, living in the time of the Antichrist and uh, would participate in the scenario of the book of Revelations. I mean, this is psychosis if you meet it in a person. If you meet it in a culture, it's called religious piety and conviction. Uh, and it has been going on so long that it has actually created a very narrow neck in the historical process that cannot be avoided. We now have no choice in the matter of business as usual. There will not apparently be business as usual. There will either be an apocalyptic destruction of the planet, a kind of Ragnarok, a Gotterdammerung, a complete storm of fire brought on by the eruption of the psychotic mythologies that have driven the matter-centered uh, monotheistic male ego culture or there will be a, uh, a plucking of victory from the jaws of that defeat and not an apocalypse but a kind of cultural millennium a complete breaking out of the pattern into something else and some of you may know um, Rian Eisler's work, The Chalice and the Blade. If you haven't read this book, I recommend it to you for psychedelic people, for feminists, for people concerned with the state of society. This is certainly an important book. And what she's saying is partnership. It is not true that the story of the human race is the story of a pendulum swing between matriarchy and patriarchy, each with its own flaws. It, rather, it is that human beings have always lived in an e equilibrium-style partnership society, except during the last 8,000 years, this pattern has been disrupted by the rise of the male ego, the suppression of the Logos-like connection to nature, and uh, uh, a certain evolutionary path taken in the epigenetic coding of information. In other words, the phonetic alphabet. The phonetic alphabet, which has no reference to the icon of the things expressed is utterly cool, utterly unable then to give you any feeling of engagement which, with what is being described. This gives permission for analytical science and the detachment of rationalism and uh, the sorts of philosophies that have created the tremendous split between head and heart that characterizes the political systems of, of, uh, of the last several hundred years. Well, this thing which the shamans are contacting, which we can call another dimension, hyperspace, the collective unconscious, whatever it is, it is the ground of our becoming. And the only way to, to sort of unhitch ourselves from the ego is to open pathways of communication to this invisible field of intentionality in which we are embedded. And this is a very difficult task because the culture in which we live denies that this thing even exists. I mean, if you start saying that you feel the heartbeat of the planet or that you are in resonance with the local ecosystem or still worse, if you say that you hear the voices of elves and fairies, this is psychopathy automatically. You know, you have to be observed sedated and cured 
because uh, you, you're participating in a model of reality that is not consensually validated. Nevertheless, I think what we're trying to do it, with meetings like this is empower this particular meme, empower this idea. Uh, I can't remember who developed the idea of memes, but it's basically the notion that ideas compete with each other the way animals and plants compete in an ecosystem. That ideas uh, adapt and spread and occupy niches and defend territory and redefine environments. And so my mentioning last night of the woman who said to me, I thought I was crazy until I heard you speak. For me, that is really the nugget of this work and the most satisfying kind of comment that anybody could make because uh, what has happened since the 1960s is the straight people all went off together and by this I don't refer to sexual preference, I use straight in the earlier sense. The straight people all went off and became very weird together, <laughs> you know, with their golden Mercedes and their Picasso ceramics and all that. Uh, the freaks all went off and became strange alone each apart in our own way because community was shattered, affinity groups were suppressed, people went all kinds of directions. Now, uh, the people who went through the 60s, uh, approaching or in their 40s, have had 20 years to see how they like that kind of uh, alienated aloneness. And so this morning as we went around, I heard many people saying, uh, uh, you know, that they had done these things in the 60s but not for a long time and now they were returning to it. I think this is because it finally dawns on you that, you know, this may be the only shot you've got at it. I mean, reincarnation is fine, past <laughs> lives are fine, but we're all getting daily older and uh, we don't know where we came from you know, what lies beyond the zygote. And we don't know where we're going, what lies beyond the pine box. Who can say? So out of the incredible mystery of whatever the universe is, a microsecond of opportunity against impossible odds has sprung into being. We are embedded in that moment of opportunity. So what are you going to do with it? Are you going to sweep up around the ashram for 30 years and then <laughs> decide that that was a mistake? Or, you know, are you going to just give yourself over to the arms of Holy Mother Church uh, for a lifetime? I mean, people do this. You cannot escape making some kind of commitment to something. Nobody gets through life without uh, being asked to, uh, to sign up either in their own club or somebody else's. The mushroom said to me once uh, in the way that it does when it delivers these aphorisms, it said, uh, you must have a plan. If you have no plan, you will become part of somebody else's plan. You either have a plan or you are part of somebody else's plan. And so I think, uh, I think people are waking up to the fact that uh, we must use what works. Because you see, uh, someone on this side of the room, when we went around, talked about yoga and how the, you know, the psychedelic gives the experience on demand and but are we ready and how do you gain skills and this sort of thing. To my mind, the goal is not the psychedelic experience. The beginning of the path is the psychedelic experience. 
so if yoga promises that after 20 years it will deliver you to the beginning of the path <laughs> then you know there's something seriously wrong here uh, the, the psychedelic sets you at the beginning of the path and then people do all kinds of things with it I mean I am amazed I feel there is more variation in how we deal with this than in almost any other phase of human activity because some people seem to have almost no self-reflection and I've noticed it also touches sexuality because I don't know how many of you have ever encountered the play uh, the penthouse forum but this is where people write into penthouse and and detail these astonishing sexual unpredictable sexual exploits threesomes foursomes and twelvesomes that just fell upon them and whenever I uh, have for some reason some occasion to read these things <laughs> what is amazing to me is that this appears to be uh, descriptions of the behavior of an alien species <laughs> because there is no self-reflection on what does this mean you know what does this mean that I get stuck in an elevator and end up copulating with 12 stockbrokers <laughs> it's just it's just uh, it's just accepted as uh, how it is well you get this same thing with psychedelics where you say to someone and they say oh yeah in the night in the 60s I took psychedelics you know wow it was really strange all these colors and and voices and uh, and apparently no self-reflection no realization that this is actually happening to you this is happening to you therefore the implications must be fairly central and then other people immediately get it they say you know my gosh this plant this pill shows me that reality is at least a thousand times larger than I thought it was showed me that I don't know who I am where I am what I am or anything else uh, and I don't know what it takes to uh, to instill that in people maybe intellectual self-reflection one of the things that is so puzzling about uh, shamans when you actually deal with them in the field is they are not like the other people in the tribe the other people in the tribe are very tribal people in other words they have all the curious cultural limitations of people in every culture they think you smell funny they think you look funny everything you do is amusing uh, they stand around in small groups giggling and pointing and uh, like that the shamans on the other hand it's nothing like that they accept you totally as a person they make no cultural judgments you don't look funny smell funny uh, so forth and so on because they are what I call extra environmental extra environmentals they are deconditioned from the assumptions of their own culture so they may be the Witoto shaman but the Witoto shaman is less Witoto than any other Witoto because the Witoto shaman operates in the context of Witotoness embedded in the larger reality and so I think what we need to do when we try to revivify shamanism in our own lives is recover uh, the profound <clears throat> reality of what it's doing sometimes I have flashes when I'm giving these talks of how different it is to be stoned than to talk about being stoned I mean here we sit you know in our cotton underwear <laughs> just uh, with our where we came from our schedules in front of us uh, the mundaneness of it is so all-pervasive 
and we could be discussing Gnosticism or a political action project, or, but we're discussing instead something really appalling, I think. I mean, we're calmly discussing the fact that there is another world overlapping our own, and uh, very few people will even admit the fact. So I always think, and, and this is my symbol of myself, to myself, I always think of a wonderful B science fiction movie I saw when I was a kid where uh, there's a dinosaur in the swamp and uh, it's set somewhere in Mexico and uh, the typical campesino is sent by the patron of the ranch uh, to gather firewood in the jungle and he of course encounters this extremely large rubber reptile roaring around and then comes back to the ranch and is pointing back in the woods and is completely inarticulate trying to say you know a, a creature from the id a beast from another dimension is rampaging around in the forest well they just dismiss him as you know these peasants they believe anything you can't trust them for a moment this is the sort of uh, situation we're in uh, the extraterrestrial invasion that so many uh, people anticipate or the extraterrestrial contact that so many people uh, hope for and that sells so many cheap newspapers is well underway. It's simply that the words we have to describe it are utterly inadequate. So words like extraterrestrial invasion, contact with an intelligent species, end of history, migration into hyperspace, these are pathetic signifiers of what is actually happening to us. What is actually happening to us is uh, pretty darn hard to wrap your mind around. We are caught in a vortex of concrescence and compression that was set in motion at least as early as the melting of the last glaciation. We are reaping the fruits of 10,000, 50,000 years of sowing of the fields of mind and it is being dropped into our laps for us to create uh, you know, human machine interfacing, uh, control of genetic material, redefinition of uh, social reality, re engineering of languages, uh, revisioning of the planetary ecology. All these things fall upon us, and for us to be worthy of it, for us to make sense of it, for us to be anything other than victimized by the 20th century, we need, I think, to reach back into time and to uh, anchor ourselves with the transcendent mystery, which is uh, somehow tied up with our own being, somehow present on the planet, but mostly a large list of unanswered questions. We don't know what is going on on this planet. We don't know why there is life here, whether it's an accident, somebody's plan. Uh, we don't know why intelligence is here. Again, accident, plan, if plan, whose plan, if plan, for what, uh, if plan, where are we in the plan? I mean, we all uh, tend, when we abandon ourselves to cultural values, to focus in so tightly that we lose the big picture. And if psychedelics are anything, they are a zoom lens back to the broadest possible uh, point of view. Well, why don't we stop there uh, and take a, just a 10 minute break or something, and then we'll come back and do dialogue on this. <clears throat> so uh, why don't we use the rest of this morning to see if we're getting oriented right and to 
just discuss any questions you have or anything that comes up for you out of this so far. Does anybody have anything? Yeah. Um, I was curious about uh, what you were talking about with extraterrestrials and not having the appropriate language to really discuss it and like your view of what's going on and can you put it in words so that we can <laughs> well um, it's, it changes for me all the time I mean I'm not I don't have a point of view and my primary job is not public speaking or writing but exploring when I first started taking mushrooms in and Throughout the 70s, when we wrote the Mushroom Grower's Guide, my I, I held several opinions, but my most strongly held opinion was it actually is an extraterrestrial. Just no shit, flat out, it is an extraterrestrial. And what's surprising to me is that... Uh, a single mushroom trip uh, of a certain sort could probably put me right back there again. Uh, getting it worked down to Gaia or the overmind of the species is a kind of process of coming down from the real unassimilatable uh, uh, context of the of uh, the experience it's like an extraterrestrial it's i mean i would certainly say this you know if extraterrestrials appeared over washington and moscow tomorrow it wouldn't make this any less mysterious or puzzling uh, in fact uh, the extraterrestrials might turn out to be mundane this is not uh, how it speaks this is the most astonishing thing for me to get used to. I mean, the visual hallucination, somehow I can work it around that these are floods of imagery set off from deep structures of the brain and dumping of memory banks, and, but that it can just address you in real time and say, Terrence, <laughs> you know, and then proceed to blow my mind. The only, and now several things may be happening here, uh, the only time when we have the experience of focusing on an incoming message, decoding it in real time, and responding to it immediately, is when we have a conversation with someone. So if you find yourself responding to a message in real time, uh, your brain automatically thinks you're having a conversation. Saying, you know, if it looks like a duck, if it walks like a duck, it must be a duck. So here I am listening and responding to someone speaking to me in English. Therefore, this must be a conversation. Uh, there are physical arguments for viewing the mushroom as extraterrestrial. First of all, what is psilocybin? Psilocybin is 4-phosphoroxy-NN-dimethyltryptamine. Of all the indole compounds in nature, of all the indole compounds in nature, only psilocybin is uh, uh, hydroxylated at the four position. Well, now, if you were to design a computer program to search Earth, to search the life forms of Earth for evidence of extraterrestrial origin, one of the things you would tell this program to do is look for unusual molecules that have no apparent cousins or relatives among other organisms. Well, here is psilocybin, phosphorylated in the four position. Nothing else on Earth is. A, a, a material argument for its origin outside of the terrestrial ecosystem. Um, a slightly different argument 
that would see the mushroom as extraterrestrial is uh, look at its uh, style, for want of a better word. I mean, what is a mushroom? First of all, they reproduce by spores. Spores are the most economical biological unit imaginable. They can survive the uh, radiation levels of interstellar space. They can survive for eons under conditions very close to those encountered in deep space. Uh, the mushroom spore falls into an ecosystem immediately undergoes uh, uh, cell division, a fine thread-like network full of neurotransmitters begins to spread itself through the soil. It's a very closely analogous to the neural network of a higher animal, including a human being. Now, we're accustomed to thinking that an extraterrestrial would bear the imprint of the evolutionary situation in which it came to be. In other words, if it, was, if it evolved on a low gravity planet, it will be tall and thin. If it evolved in a methane atmosphere, it will have an exotic body chemistry and so forth. But that's because we ourselves have possessed the knowledge of how DNA works for only about 40 years. Uh, it's reasonable to assume, I think, that if an intelligent species gets a thousand years of study of mm -hmm. DNA, that they can design themselves to be however they care to be. And in fact, if you think of the mushroom from that point of view, I think that we might choose that kind of an adaptation if we could have any form we wanted because it's very non-invasive, very humbly insinuates itself into a situation and grows essentially on waste material in the soil, yet when it sporulates it can actually cross uh, spatial, the boundary of outer space and uh, you know, great economy, great artistry, tremendous zen-like aesthetics seem expressed in the mushroom if you view it as a designed piece of work rather than an object in the environment. And then finally, of course, the, the major argument for the extraterrestrial origin of the mushroom, but it's an insider argument, is the content of the experience. Number one, it says it's an extraterrestrial organism and it has the data to back up the claim. It can show you movies of desert worlds, jungle worlds, high pressure, high gravity methane worlds, worlds, uh, planets whose cores are helium-4 and uh, worlds un where you don't know whether you're inside an organism or inside some kind of piece of machinery, whether you're under the surface of a planet. I mean, th literally things that our minds just stop in the presence of. So to me, that's really the interesting thing about the mushroom is that it can be as friendly as it needs to be and can even reassure you with a Disney-esque uh, burlesque of dancing flowers and uh, pirouetting pink elephants. But once you are comfortable with it and enter the dialogue and begin to get to know it, getting to know it is an appalling experience because you can say to it, show me a little more of who you are for yourself and then, you know, a veil is lifted and your jaw just drops. And then you say, show me a little more of who you... And that's enough of who you are for yourself. Because, and you wonder, you know, while this thing is talking to me, is it talking... Is, how engaged is the mushroom by me? 
Is, it, is all of its attention focused upon me when I'm talking to it the way all of my attention is focused back on it? Or is it like a multi-user computer system? Is it able to simultaneously deal with huge numbers of organisms? What is the relationship of psilocybin to the inner life of the mushroom? Is it stoned all the time? Why does it want why is it so important that these indole compounds get lodged in the nervous system of mammals? It's almost as though it's a symbiotic relationship that the mushroom does not truly live its life unless it is taken, unless its molecular, uh, its unique molecular component can find its way into the synapses of a self-reflecting higher animal. Well, then, what is it? What are we for? For it? And you know, you can ask these questions. Well, I think that it's for service. Like they don't, you know, they don't impose themselves on us. You have to. Them. Yes, they usually, uh, one reason I think people have had trouble confirming the animate and intelligent quality of the mushroom is you must ask. You know, you just don't take psilocybin and sit there because it won't do it. But if you take psilocybin and call it in, in some sense, whatever that means, invoke, call, uh, uh, try to uh, visualize, then it will begin to come towards you and lift these veils and this world of zany, pun-like, hyperdimensional intelligence that is revealed is as strange as an extraterrestrial would be. This is, I guess, the final content of evidence <coughs> for the extraterrestrial origin is the fact that it just seems so different from anything one could conceive of or imagine. I mean, you cannot, in one of these volleys of hallucination, convince yourself, this is only me. These are my memories, or these are distorted transforms of past experience. Or, because, uh, you know, I was, uh, I was trained as an art historian to have an eye for stylistic difference and cohesion of, uh, of uh, a set of aesthetic canons and it just blows my mind. I mean there is more art locked up in these things to be viewed in a single hour than the human race has produced in 10,000 years. I mean an art of a compelling weird, breathtaking, awesome quality that just breathes in every pore of itself. You know, this is the other. This is not you. Don't be deceived, my little primate friend. Uh, <laughs> yeah. It seems like our popular culture has had inklings of that. Because if you look at the movies that came out, you know, between 1952 and 1962, so many of the sci-fi movies are about spores from outer space and plants coming down. And these are from very straight people who hadn't taken, you know, psychedelics at all. They were like tuning, maybe they were, you know, tuning into what was about to come 10 or 15 years later. Well, I think, uh, and I'm, so far as I know, pretty alone in this opinion, that uh, information actually, a very small percentage of information is able to tunnel backward through time. That there is a very small counterflow to the forward movement of causal efficacy. And one of the things that shamanism is about is going into that hyperdimensional place and picking up this thin, thin signal from the future and tuning it in. This is why prophecy and seership and all of that has to do with states of ecstasy and intoxication. Uh, one way of viewing uh, all religion and all uh, spiritual metaphor making is as an anticipation of the future. These Western religions have this apocalyptic transformation built into them almost as a self-fulfilling prophecy. 
In other words, they believe the world is going to end because the world is going to end. And since the melting of the glaciers, people of sufficient sensitivity have heard through a vast wall of stochastic noise coming from the future, the thin, reedy broadcast of uh, the true vision of the future. And this seems to be one of the things that you can do with these psychedelics is tune this in. It, you know, it's a cliche, and I'm sure you've heard it, that artists are society's antenna for change, that artists are supposed to be somehow uh, m more sensitive than the rest of us, and, and they pick up the new design forms, the evolving aesthetic canons, and then translate it into society for the rest of us. Well, that gains a little more bite if you substitute shaman for artist and realize that this may not be a metaphor. It may not be simply because they pursue bohemian lifestyles and are willing to accept poverty for a life of free thinking and so forth. That isn't what's allowing an anticipation of the future. What's happening is there truly is an anticipation of the future. And uh, uh, visionaries like William Blake or, or the author of Revelations are actually people who, by virtue of some fortuitous confluence of circumstance, space, time, and uh, genetic constitution, are able to draw these messages out. What is startling is that apparently this is fairly ordinary in psychedelic states. That in fact, uh, one way of thinking of psychedelics is uh, you begin to move through time when you put them into your life. I don't mean while the trip is happening. I mean ever after. I mean, if you're living with a 1960s-style mind and you have a strong psychedelic experience, you will come down with a 1970s mind or perhaps a 2040-style mind. Mind is a temporal style. It, it's important to have this information and to have it at your fingertips. People... The compartmentalization between areas of knowledge that impinge on this always amazes me. I mean, you get psychologists who don't know what an MAO inhibitor is. Uh, you get uh, people combining things without knowing how drug synergies work. Uh, you get people, you know, just not informing themselves on the importance of set, setting, dosage, psychic predisposition, so forth and so on, all vital matters that can uh, impinge on uh, how an experience develops. And if, if you will take the time to inform yourself, you will feel much more sure of what you're doing, and that in itself can alleviate uh, uh, confusion and uh, negative reactions. Well, so then I thought what I would do is uh, <clears throat> sort of go around the world and talk about these things a little to give you an idea of what is available, what's on the menu, and, uh, and then we'll take a little break, a very short break, and then come back and talk about it. Sure, absolutely. Um, did I hear you correctly that uh, chemical, the liquid DMSO, drinking the five to seven ounces a day for five days precipitates a psychedelic experience? No, did I say DMSO? That's why I was one graphic. Is it DMSO? Or no, it, it isn't DMSO. If I said that, I didn't mean to. It's di ethyl di. Dimethylacetamide. Oh, I thought you said sulfoxide. I may have said sulfoxide. Dimethyl. Dimethylacetamide. And uh, I can show you the river right here. You just, while I'm raving, you just look it up in there and find it and satisfy yourself. Yeah. 
Sharon? Yeah. Well, you start, could you explain the difference between psychoactive, psychotropic, and psychedelic? Because I don't understand what they mean. Yeah, if I can. Uh, a psychoactive means exactly what it implies, that you can detect this compound as a higher cortical experience. That's all. I mean, to my mind, a higher cortical experience is a shift of mood, uh, depression, elation, uh, uh, acute hearing, sensitivity to noises. All of these things could be classed as psychoactive uh, reactions to a compound. Psychotropic is a word that I've never been very fond of, and it sort of came in late. Uh, uh, psychedelic, which is a fairly maligned word, but was coined by the psychiatrist Humphrey Osmond, uh, means simply mind manifesting. And I like that because it's phenomenologically neutral. Now, some people have tried to push the word entheogen for these things, meaning literally God-inducing. But to my mind, this carries a huge amount of ideological freight that we may not or wish to buy into. I mean, maybe it's God-inducing, maybe it isn't. But uh, uh, psychedelic, meaning mind-manifesting, is pretty good. And then if all of these make you uncomfortable, you can just fall back on a completely phenomenological description and call them consciousness-expanding drugs. But there are drugs that I would not... I, for instance, I don't consider... Well, I certainly don't consider alcohol a psychedelic, but clearly a psychoactive. Uh, well... Uh, Marijuana is one of these things that's so widely variant, both in how people react to it and how strong it can be. I would call MDMA a psychoactive drug, not a psychedelic drug. And then I use the word hallucinogen a lot. And a lot of people don't like that, even people in the field, and say, well, hallucinogen seems to imply that it's an illusion but not to, in my mind, I don't hear that. I'm fascinated by hallucinations. I mean, to me, that is the sine qua non that you're getting somewhere. I guess because it's just my philosophical biases. But, when, but a hallucination, it's such an extraordinary concept, isn't it? To see something which isn't there. And I don't mean to misread a surface so that you think it sticks into the room which in fact sticks out of the room or something. I mean seeing something that is not there. And then that divides into two classes. Seeing an ordinary object which is not there. And I think this is what most people think a hallucination is. Here is a bicycle. Is it real or not? The drug-crazed victim cannot tell. But... <laughs> Most hallucinations are of things which can only be hallucinations because they, that's what they are, you know. And so they have this aura of the unexpected and the other and, uh, and the intrusive alienness. Uh, people have claimed to me that they have seen objects which are not there, which are completely ordinary. That is more typical of accounts of Datura users, people who take uh, high molecular weight tropanes, such as occur in Jimson weed and those kind of things. But my brief experimentation with that is it is uh, what I call a, a, a deliriant rather than a psychoactive. I mean, when you take Datura, you are so messed up that you can't, you literally lose all discrimination. Yeah, belladonna. You can't tell exactly where you are. You can't tell thinking about being somewhere from being there. Well, this you're in no shape to undertake a spiritual quest if you're that discombobulated. So uh, what I like are the things which do not destroy what I call core functions. In other words, 
there is still an evidence-gathering, observing mind left intact, and the um, disruption of perceptual input, if you want to put it that way, is pretty much confined to the visual cortex and then to the to the uh, metaphor forming capacity that is relating to the visual cortex. But I don't like things which confuse you, which impair judgment. Uh, what about sativa divinorum? Salvia divinorum. Well, that's a kind of a, that's an obscure one about which not much is known. Although in the past year they've learned the absolute chemical characterization of the psychoactive compound, which is called salvorine alpha. Um, more work has to be done. Anthropologists who have taken it with Indians uh, in Oaxaca describe a very intense experience. When we grew it in Hawaii and took it exactly the way these people said to do it, it was an experience, but it was not clear whether it was psychedelic or merely so physiologically active in such a complex way that you couldn't tell exactly what was going on. The impression, which was not mine, but uh, uh, cats and a beloved dean... Uh, they both experienced uh, flow. They described the experiences as though you were lying in a dirty ditch <laughs> <laughs> with this cold fluid flowing from the top of your head to the bottom of your feet and where this kind of cold, clammy fluid encountered energy obstructions in your body, it would wash them away but it was a kind of vertigo with nausea, with, I mean, it was a complex uh, experience, but it was not largely mental. Mm -hmm. It was more a revisioning of the body image. And, you know, this is another one of these things where no research uh, has been done. It isn't illegal, uh, Salvia Divinorum, but you're not going to do your career any good to get tangled up with this. So consequently, it's pretty much left alone. Salvorine Alpha is extremely unstable and breaks down within 12 hours. So that indicates it's probably a polyhydric alcohol or an isoquinone or something like that. It's not an indole. Yeah. I'm just curious, um, and Watson talks about antins versus hallucinogens, and uh, he's really against the word... Hallucinogen. Yeah, he's the one who proposed entheogen. Entheogen, right. And so, because he, his theory was, I guess, that he thought that a hallucination was something that wasn't there completely. And he thought that the experience on the soma or the mushroom was something that you actually are experiencing. So it's not a hallucination, it's real. Yeah, that was what he said. Um, but if you actually look at the etymology of the word hallucination, what it's come to mean in English is a delusion, a delusion. But what it really means in the original uh, language is to wander in the mind. That's the meaning of hallucination, to wander in the mind. Well, that's a pretty good operational description of what's happening. And then when you add in the visual component... Uh, uh, I don't know. It's hard for me to imagine how someone could undervalue hallucinations if they had had them. Yeah, it sounds like it was reacting to the 60s hoopla a lot, the, the, uh, the hoopla over LSD and the misreading of what these experiences really were, too. Well, these guys were very uh, frustrated with seeing this thing turned into a social hysteria. And Wasson, you know, at times expressed great unhappiness with Tim Leary's approach and hated going to Mexico and seeing these mushroom villages invaded by graffiti-covered vans of filthy freaks from Southern California who were disrupting the local ecology. And uh, it was a kind of proprietary approach, you know. This thing belongs to anthropologists, to specialists, uh, Watson was very reticent to, 
to assess his own work. Some of you may have seen Bob Forte's interview with him in the, that psychedelic issue of revision where Forte asks him, how do you assess the historical impact of your work? And he said, you know, I, I'll leave that to others to decide. He didn't want to deal with the question of the potential impact on his own society. He really looked at it as this exotic, foreign kind of thing. These guys were cautious, this first generation. Hoffman, Wasson, Schultes. These, are, these guys are not stoners by any means. I mean, their approach is cautious and the psychedelic experiences can be counted on the fingers of one hand in a lifetime. So I'm not sure they ever realized the size of the tiger whose tail they had seized. Yeah. Uh, the the uh, DMT and the frog, uh, whatever it is, how is that extracted? I mean, how that frog slime or whatever it is? Toad. Uh, Toad. Bam- yeah, bam- right. Okay, now I want to know about that. Well, I haven't had the good fortune to be present at the milking, uh, so I really couldn't say. But as I gather, you put pressure on the back of the neck in two places, and this exudate emerges exactly where I'm not sure and probably decency should safely scarcely inquire (laughs) and then it's dried on sheets of glass and scraped up and packaged and so forth well let me start through this and uh, give you a notion of what is available whenever you talk about the, the distribution and cultural usage of hallucinogens the first thing that you come up against is a curious, unsolved problem in botany, which is no one knows why this is, and we would be grateful if somebody could figure it out. But for unknown reasons, there is a tremendous concentration of psychoactive plants in the, on the South American continent. The South American continent has more known hallucinogens than the rest of the planet combined. Now, why is this? After all, the climax tropical rainforests of eastern Indonesia are at least as species-rich as the Amazon basin, and yet not a single powerful hallucinogen is known with certainty from the old world tropics. Uh, All kinds of suggestions have been made that actually... There are psychedelic plants common throughout the, the tropics of the old world, but the cultures have lost contact with them and forgotten them, and hence our anthropologists have not discovered them. Or something in the soil of South America. Very improbable theory. Uh, I was talking about this once in a workshop and somebody raised their hand and said, well, no problem. Obviously, that's where the spaceships landed. (laughs) Good. Well, we've solved that problem. Now we can move on. Uh, North America is extraordinarily poor in hallucinogens, perhaps the poorest of all continents, so that the, the psychedelic phobia that Europe created against paganism was completely reinforced or at least not eroded by the colonization of the New World or of North America because there were no plants here to challenge that. The North American Indians tend to ordeal as a shamanic vehicle, the sun dance thing some of you may be familiar with, or sonic driving, which is worldwide in in shamanically oriented cultures without drugs, you should know that not everyone agrees with me that uh, um, psychedelics are the sine qua non of shamanism. That's what Wasson thought, that you don't have shamanism unless you have psychedelics. If you have people calling themselves shamans and not using psychedelics, then they are uh, cut off from the older level of tradition and through ritual, drumming, ordeals, starvation, flagellation, they are creating near-psychedelic or pseudo-psychedelic states. Uh, Now, uh, 
brilliant and respected commentator on comparative religion like Merci Eliad, who I quote whenever it suits my purpose, uh, totally disagreed with this and said no, what he called narcotic shamanism, which means psychedelic shamanism, the choice of the word tells you that the guy had a problem. Narcotic shamanism is decadent shamanism. And the flagellation, the starvation, the ordeals and the drumming, that's the real shamanism. And it's only when the tradition is abandoned and decadent that, that a culture will turn to drugs. I maintain this is nothing more than he was a Romanian who became an academic in Paris. I maintain that this is nothing more than his Western cultural bias operating. Also in his youth, he was pretty infatuated with yoga. They will insist to you, you know, that drugs are an inferior path. However, any of you who are scholars of yoga should know that all yoga is based on the yogic sutras of Patanjali, second century BC uh, Hindu Vedic commentator. And Patanjali specifically says there are three paths to the goal of yoga and they are control of the breath, control of posture, and light-filled herbs. says it right there, stanza six of the Yogic Sutra of Patanjali. It's never discussed again, basically, in the entire exegesis of the yogic literature. The third path is never mentioned. Well, is that because it's a secret tradition or what? I don't know. When you go to India seeking these yogins, practicing these higher yogas, what you find are a bunch of guys smoking as much charas as they possibly can. And the notion that you could do it without that it just gets a long laugh from everybody down around the burning guts. I mean, they, they deal with it on a practical level. Okay, moving out of drug-impoverished North America or psychedelic-impoverished North America, where there are uh, uh, more than 20 species of indigenous psilocybin-containing mushrooms, but, and this is interesting, no evidence whatsoever for uh, tribal or traditional usage. In other words, in this Northwest Coast Indian complex, the Shimsham, Klingit, Nutka group, no uh, reason to believe, other than our own predilection for romantic fantasy, that these people were using mushrooms uh, in pre-contact times, and yet the mushrooms were there. Uh, the complex that we're most familiar with as a North American hallucinogen is in the southwest of the United States, peyote, Lophophora williamsi, uh, the, the peyotal cactus. Now, the interesting thing here is uh, we cannot find archaeological evidence of peyote use that is particularly ancient. Uh, peyote use does, in the southwest appears to be less than 500 years old. Before that, what we find in Indian graves of the Tarahumara and so forth are the seeds of Sephora secundifolia. Sephora secundifolia is a highly poisonous legume that contains cysteine. This is an example of what we call not a psychedelic, but an ordeal poison. Now, in certain parts of the world, this approach to spiritual growth has been taken, most notably in, on the island of Madagascar, off the coast of uh, Eastern Africa. What is an ordeal poison? This is a plant where you take it and you are so convinced that you're dying that you have an experience of self-abandonment, uh, getting straight, surrender, and then you live. And you're fine. You know, you, but but you are absolutely convinced that you're dying. Your heart pounds or fibrillates or you convulse or you fall into deep coma or you become have tetanus in the limbs, whatever it is, 
and then you recover. Well, anybody can tell you this is a kind of psychedelic experience because you're so damn glad you lived that you see everything in a new light. You can be kind to your children and love your wife and tolerate your relatives. And People say, well, it made a new man out of him. Well, yes, because he came so close to dying that uh, he shed uh, neurotic behavior patterns. But this is not a true psychedelic. So what we're assuming is that about 500 or 1,000 years ago, sometime in that span, the Sephora cult was replaced by the uh, peyote cult, which came from a much smaller usage area. Then also in Southern California, there were what were called the Tolach religions, religions of detura intoxication, initiation of young men by intoxicating them with detour and leaving them in the wilderness to fend for themselves. Again, this is, comes close to being an ordeal poison, although it also has psychoactive properties, but so confusing, such a delirium that uh, it bears no relationship to the true hallucinogens, which, with the exception of mescaline, I believe all fall into the category of the indoles. Now, mescaline is not an indole. It's an amphetamine, closely related to MDA and MDMA. Uh, but it is a true hallucinogen at fairly high doses. The indoles, which are this structurally related small family, they seem to me to be the true visionary ecstatogens. Uh, and I will mention as I go through the list which ones are indoles and which ones are not. Uh, you mean which one are well, no, the only one which is an amphetamine is mescaline, so we needn't. So you have indole and non-indole. Indole and non-indole. Uh, uh, a kind of parallel phenomenon to the peyote cult of the southwest is in the deserts of northwestern Peru. There are very large columnar cacti in the genus Trichoceras that contain mescaline. And they have been used for a long time, a lot longer than peyote. We have uh, mocha ceramic uh, dated to before 1000 BC, which show, in fact, doesn't somebody wearing, yes, this gentleman has the t-shirt. This is a Peruvian design. Point out the, yes, that's the chunk of San Pedro being held by this dwarf-like little demon. This is a fang demon, mocha design, 1500 years old. <coughs> now, in central Mexico, we come upon uh, the first of these large centers of hallucinogenic use in the cultural area in which the Olmec arose were subsequently succeeded by the Maya who were subsequently subjugated by the Toltecs and the uh, plants that were in use in those situations were fall into two pretty well defined categories first of all psilocybin containing mushrooms of several species and Second of all, con uh, morning glories of at least two types, convolvulaceae, which contain LSD-like alkaloids active in the milligram range that are highly visionary. And uh, there's considerable evidence in the Codex Vindabonensis and uh, in some of the Mayan ceramics that... Uh, this was a, a, a culture that made a very important place for hallucinogens and that it was the privilege of the priestly cr class and that their uh, obsession with calendrics and astronomy and uh, this sort of thing was also somehow intimately connected to their interest in the psilocybin mushrooms. And hua, again, one of these botanical puzzles, here is a cluster of uh, 10 or 15 species in central Mexico of mushrooms, and a culture builds itself around them. Uh, a similar cluster of species on the nor northwest coast, the culture seems to totally ignore it and have no use for it. And nowhere else on Earth are there clusters of species of psilocybin mushrooms uh, with a long history of use. Naturally, the export of cattle throughout the warm tropics 
has allowed the coprophytic mushrooms, the mushrooms which grow on manure, to be spread throughout the warm tropics. And then in places like England and France, you get the occurrence of the diminutive psilocybin mushrooms, lanceata. But again, only the most unconvincing evidence of traditional use. I mean, I am Irish, Celtic. I would love to have somebody come up with a, a bunch of evidence that ancient Celtic and Druidic art and magic was somehow related to mushrooms. But to date, the efforts have been unconvincing to any skeptic. Uh, it may still be there. Perhaps in heraldic devices, someone should go back and study the escutcheon of the families of medieval Europe. And you do find, for instance, the Morel family, Morelli, noble Italian family, mushrooms on the, on the family coat of arms, and uh, other families in France whose names escape me. Yeah, although that is a coincidence, not Well, a I mean, not, not, yeah, but still, that name. Will the sergeant at arms. <laughs> Okay, so, oh, well, let me say something a little bit more <clears throat> about the morning glory complex because it's very interesting. Uh, LSD discovered by Albert Hoffman in 1937 and so forth uh, comes from ergot, comes from uh, an organism called claviceps or claviceps paspale, which is a smut which grows on ergot, a humbler organism. You could hardly imagine. I mean, this is basically yuck, is how you would describe this organism if you were to come upon it. It looks like a mistake because it's just an amorphous, slimy black mess growing on certain cereal grains. And one of the fascinating questions to these chemists, once they discover a new compound, is to try and figure out, does it occur anywhere else in nature? some plants, some fish, some something, and then they, you, know, you can form uh, theories and judgments about evolutionary relationships. Uh, so Albert Hoffman, the discoverer of LSD, was amazed when carrying out analytical work for Gordon Wasson on magic morning glory seeds that had been sent to Wasson from Schulte's he discovered the same compounds or very closely related compounds as he had synthesized to make LSD. Uh, I'm going to slightly uh, jump around here now and say that uh, in India there are 13 species of morning glory.